Uh, hello, everyone, and thanks for waiting. Sorry about that. We had technical difficulties, but I think technical difficulties is an essential part of any art or academic event. So that's a kind of the best way to start any event, I think. I hope everybody's keeping safe, both from the biological virus and the nasty and longer term persisting effects and after effects of imperialism and colonialism that we are still living through as we've been witnessing the past uh, weeks for important reasons. Welcome to this John Hansard Gallery talk with artist David Blandy. Um, the talk is connected to Hansard's online exhibitions program that is supported by the Bark and Mill Foundation. Um, joining David today's, in today's discussion and talk is my dear colleague, Dr. Megan de brown Mollet who's a teaching fellow in digital media practice at Winchester School of Art. And me, my name is Yusuf Arika, and I work also at Winchester School of Art as professor in technological culture and aesthetics. And I'll be also chairing this discussion session. Um, for John Hansard Gallery's online exhibition program, David Blandy produced two thought-provoking tutorials, How to Fly and How to Live. I hope you've already seen them. If not, they are online. They were especially commissioned to reflect on the uncertain times that we currently find ourselves in. Through um, his diverse practice, David draws on multiple elements of the culture that surrounds us, reflecting on the imaginary spaces that form our identity delving deep into video games, popular culture genres, internet culture. He's fascinated by each form's potential for communality and finding new forms of kinship. And these pieces at Hansard work effectively with affect, I would say, creating these subtle nuances, subtle nuances in how the narrative works in relation to the game and animation aesthetics and how that affect resonates in the current situation in interesting ways that we'll definitely discuss. Um, but also we'll discuss broadly many other things as well about David's practice, um, perhaps also touching on his collaboration with uh, Larry Achiampong, whose work has also been featured at the Hansard, as well as various questions about identity, digital art, curatorial and exhibition practices, artistic methods in these strange times lots of topics we can dive into and resurface back from. Um, and just to remind you, of course, both of these tutorials can be viewed online at John Hansard Gallery's website at jhg.art. And even if we started a bit late, we'll make sure that there's an opportunity to post questions in the chat, chat window of the Zoom, and we'll try to answer as many as possible um, in the last, let's say, 15 minutes, 20 minutes of the event um, but we need to get going anyway. So uh, we'll start again. Thanks for joining us, David. Thanks, Megan. We'll start with a brief presentation by David to get us all warmed up about topics and approaches that offers a useful context. And we'll then proceed to discussion with Megan and David. But David, thanks for being with us here. Thank you very much, Yusi. It's, um, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you for the introduction and thank you, John Hansard, for the opportunity to make this work and to show the work. And thank you, Megan, too, for taking part in this discussion. I think it's going to be really interesting. Um, I'm just going to do a very, like, a, a whistle-stop tour through some of my work just to give a background to where, 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 <laughs> where these two pieces have come from. Um, for the past 20 years now, I've been using myself as an anthropological subject, dissecting um, my various obsessions to try and work out who I am, where I'm placed in society and culture and history, and um, how all of those things come together. And... Um, a lot of that has been through um, pop culture, and I'm just going to open up my PowerPoint um, here. Um, so, yeah, 20 years ago I made this work, which is called uh, Ring, which is taking the background from a computer game called Tekken 2, um, Yoshimitsu stage, and thinking about how inside this, this engine of, of violence, this place where you're supposed to beat other people up, um, there was this kind of sublime space that you could enter and um, be a part of. And in some ways, um, I think my work has, has taken these two paths. They've been either the viewer becomes the part of um, a, 
pop cultural space or um, I become like an avatar inside that space, um, allowing you kind of a, a protagonist inside there. So with Ring, which was a video projection where you would kind of go into the room and this, this uh, landscape of forest would go past, and I was very much the, the viewer became part of that space. But in um, Child of the Atom, which is a work from 2010, um, it became, um, I was the avatar in there as um, this kind of, yeah, was, I was partly myself, but I was also this fictional character, the child of the atom, um, coming down to Hiroshima and trying to con confront the fact that my grandfather always believed that the Hiroshima bomb saved his life as the Japanese prisoner of war. So it was kind of confronting my ideas around um, my relationship to Japan, but also my relationship to things like anime and computer games, things that I love that I feel are very much part of me, but at the same time, um, it creates a kind of a, a difficulty because of this history. Um, as I said, I'm going to go through this quickly. There's quite a lot that could be said about some of these works, but with, um, and one of the things that came out of that work was creating a, uh, a fighting game, a 2D fighting game where you could play various alter egos of myself. So here you have the Barefoot Lone Pilgrim on the left and the, the Orochi Pilgrim on, on the right and um, Child of the Atom was the final boss. And there was also the Dave Blandy, the very weak character who just had a light punch and a hard punch. And you, you kind of went through these various stages and tried to, it's called Duels and Dualities Battle of the Soul. So it's trying to find myself inside this, this space. And it was kind of trying to, um, understand yeah you understood the meaning of it through playing it so being child of the atom was actually in the end felt like an empty experience because you're so much more powerful than anyone else so it was really boring and being david blandy was the great challenge so yes yeah, <laughs> it was, uh, it was uh, an, an interesting experiment but um one thing that i did with these these computer graphics was to explore my relationship with my father my father is a a, uh, a landscape painter and um, I'm obsessed with landscape um, and especially the landscapes found inside uh, fighting video games so here's here's one from uh, Last Blade and it's me and my kind of avatars of me and my father um, discussing our relationship to art and our relationship to each other um, and that's called backgrounds um, Another avatar that I created was uh, Anjin, taking on the history of William Adams, who's the first Englishman in Japan, supposedly, um, who ended up founding the Japanese Navy, but uh, and never returned to England. Um, yeah, the first Jap English samurai. And um, it, in this film, I kind of take this, this character, um, and then discuss the, I don't know, I guess the post-colonial condition through these, these spaces, um, moving between um, anime and uh, video and um, telling this, this other story. Um, which brings me to the first tutorial, which was, um, it's called um, How to Make a Short Video About Extinction. And it was, it's uh, slightly longer than the two tutorials that, that I made for Hansard. It's like 15 minutes long. And um, it is essentially a um, collection of various um, elements from inter the internet, like uh, bits of different TED Talks and, um, and Wikipedia links, and then all these images to do with extinction that you, you get off of off an internet search, but turned into this, uh, yeah, it becomes this, this kind of cascade of, of images that you pass through inside After Effects. So it was, it was, it was again, another, um, another tutorial based on um, my use of, of After Effects, a, a program that I've always struggled with. Um, but, um, which brings me on to using the use of Grand Theft Auto, which I first used when working with uh, Larry Achampong on part of our series, Finding Fanon. This is Finding Fanon 2. And um, Larry and my work is very much exploring um, race and identity in the, in the digital world, but also just through history and thinking about the future. But uh, in Finding Fanon 2, we're very much inside 
this virtual space using the uh, space of Grand Theft Auto V, which is a, a space of cultural violence, to think about um, yeah, to think about legacies of, of um, race and identity today. So this is us looking at a sublime landscape. I believe the, the film goes at these are the most beautiful sunsets that I've ever seen. Um, and um, I've been interested recently in exploring fantasy spaces that are actually um, communal, that in, in that you kind of, rather than going online and using the computer to explore, you use your mind and you use imagination like Dungeons and Dragons, these sort of tabletop role playing games. And so um, for a, a project called The World After, I created a, a role playing game called The World After, which um, thought about the climate cataclysm and um, identity, um, but by imagining the world in 8,000 years um, and everyone who survived has been staying in underground havens for all of that time. And then they emerge and they have to find a new um, community outside and kind of um, expel the cryorg invaders. Um, yeah, I've run several um, sessions during lockdown, which has always been interesting because there are the, all these people that I haven't met before that um, we then have quite a kind of, I guess, I guess an intimate experience with, but um, yeah. The book's available through Corner House Product um, Bookshop. There it is. <laughs> and um, then I thought I'd talk about um, the end of the world, which is where I, I use the Unity 3D engine, which is um, a engine that you normally use for making uh, video games to create a planetarium, a um, a space where you see the solar system rotating around you as um, you hear a voiceover in tone about um, different levels of grief, uh, personal grief, um, the grieving of an online community for a um, online space that's being shut down, um, which is about um, Asheron's call, which got shut down a couple of years ago. And then also uh, a kind of uh, political grief about the state of um, the world and, um, yeah, the coming of Trump and Brexit and all these things and how those those feelings kind of merge together. Um, and in some ways, the uh, how to fly and how to live, this is how to fly, the kind of beginning of it, it starts inside your desktop. So it's like your end, it's almost like you're seeing your computer first and then you enter into your computer and are invited to take the, the place of the cormorant and, and fly along with it. Um, and then there's also how to live, which um, takes these still images and turns them into living spaces, uh, spaces that you can enter into and um, manipulate and, and, and live inside. And um, I think, yeah, that's, that's, probably, that's probably enough of a context. You've got a sense of some of the work. Um, and I'll ask, yeah, you see, what did you want to ask first? I'll stop sharing here. <laughs> Stop sharing. No, <laughs> keep on sharing. Oh, that yeah. was slightly longer than I expected. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's absolutely fine. I think it's, I think um, there's a lot of fascinating sort of a themes already there in your um, presentation that we'll pick up on as well. I was already thinking that realizing when you were talking about it, this is more of a comment now again, first, um, that is, it's, there's a sort of like a mini history of games that is incorporated into your work as well. That is super interesting for m multiple reasons. <laughs> And then what is really interesting is, is this sort of a like a, across your works, there's also this zoom effect that it goes from multiple scales to different scales. But if we start from, from the kind of a, the work on at Hansard on the online as well, can you just talk a bit more about them as well, especially because I was left thinking about and, and this very striking contrast between this sort of a um, fitting into this online YouTube tutorial genre, practical, how to do things. And then the sort of a really nice way of how it shifts into this super meditative mode of, of narrative as well. Can you just speak to this sort of a like contrast a bit and give us some anchors of how to think about these, this, this perhaps the narrative delivery of this mm. and, and the ways in which it opens as well? Because I'm, I'm yes, please. Yeah, I, I mean, that's one of the things that um, 
that drew me to this form, to the, to the YouTube tutorial form, was that the possibility for having this change of register um, using the voice um, as, um, I, I guess it's a tool. I mean, that's, that's how I use it in the end of the world as well. It's, it's, it's using it as a tool so that you can somehow combine these different registers. You can buy sort of like, you can go from a very informal, um, almost chatty, semi-improvised for, for when recording those films. Um, I always have a script and then I kind of, I put the script down and I just try and try and improvise that first section. Um, Cause if, if I'm kind of reading it off, it, it just feels, it feels too stilted. And then, and then once you enter into the, the script of the film itself, it becomes very much, you know, you kind of enter into this other, other register, the kind of almost the, um, I don't know, it's not like a voice of authority, but it's sort of, I'm mean, with, with End of the World, I was thinking about the voice of the planetarium, that you're sitting in the planetarium and you have this voice inside, inside your head because it's in, in the headphones, you're looking at the cosmos and it's kind of like, it has a real intimacy and yet a kind of great profundity <laughs> at the same time. Um, but you know it's absurd because the whole situation is absurd because you're just sitting there, you know, and, and kind of in the way um, the YouTube tutorial is kind of a, absurd you're kind of you're watching someone someone sometimes it's like a 12 year old kid or something and they're showing you how to do really complex things in photoshop and it's like wow well, well thanks thanks 12 year old kid you know like there's kind of this, this ridiculous relationship that starts going on here where you know you have teacher and and student but also a kind of a, a friendship but then yeah what if you could use that intimacy that kind of semi-intimacy to enter into another space a kind of a meditative space uh a, uh, a space where somehow the mind can go through some sort of change. And that's um, with How to Fly, it was very much wanting to think about escape and changing the present situation through just almost force of will. But then How to Live, it was more about trying to create a sense where, you know, the present situation is changeable. We can change things. And that's, that's sort of where, where I was starting from with those, those. You want to pick up on that, Megan? Um, yeah, there are so many directions I could go from there. And I have so many things I'd love to ask you, but I am mindful of time. Um, I guess another thing I'd be keen to hear about. So I am going to come back to that, um, that question of teachers and students if we have time. But something I'd like to know more on a practical level is, how did you come to make these videos? Kind of what, what was your process for making these videos? How was this changed by being in lockdown or was it because you are, you know, you're a digital artist, um, I guess, predominantly. So maybe if you could speak a little about the work of this, this project and how you got here. Yeah, the, I mean, the very first um, tutorial video that I did was a response to a theme uh, it was uh, a response to the Serpentine Extinction Marathon. They have these various marathons. So they have, have a theme and they had a very limited time. It was like, I think, six weeks or something and a very limited budget. So I had to think about what could I do very simply. And this was a sort of an idea that I'd had kicking around in my head to make a tutorial of some sort. And it was also made as a semi-critique of a certain style of art that was happening at the time, which was to gather a lot of stuff from the internet and then create a, like a, a video where you're um, discussing things that perhaps you're not actually a, a part of the culture of. So kind of, you know, taking, taking anime as sort of image rather than kind of uh, fan substance in a way. Um, so I was, it, it, it kind of came from those two directions. And then I, I can, when I had the opportunity to do a random act for ch channel four, again, like a three minute format, it seemed perfect. And it was something that's going to be seen on the screen. So that's, it seemed to fit. Um, so when it came to, um, yeah, when Woodrow Kenner from uh, John Hansard Gallery approached me and asked me to, to maybe react to lockdown and make a, make a piece of work, you know, you've got a, a we want to launch in like, five weeks and um this is <laughs> this is you know you're in lockdown so think about what, what, you, what you can make in this space it seemed like making a tutorial would be 
it would make a lot of sense. People would be watching this on the screen. Uh, so it's kind of talking about the very mode, the very place that they're going to be, be experiencing it. Um, and also, um, I wanted to try and create some works which were where extinct, how to make a short film about extinction is very dark. <laughs> um, how to make a short video about ideas is sort of, yeah, it's sort of more communal. I wanted to build on the, that more, that communality and kind of create an antidote to um, the end of the world in some ways as well. So, so, so try, try and bring those things together. So that, that was, those, those were all the things going through my mind. And then on a practical level, I knew I had a PlayStation 4 here and I had Grand Theft Auto. So I knew that that was kind of in the bag. I knew that could be done. But of course, I hadn't unlocked all the, um, all the animals yet to be as avatars. <laughs> in order to do that, you have to search through the game and find uh, peyote plants <laughs> and have these kind of hallucinogenic experiences. And then you're able to unlock them in director mode. So, so that, that took some time kind of, you know, escaping from cops and, and uh, get, getting inside some helicopters to get, get the different plants. And then finally, I get into director mode, set up the thing and yeah, and, and have a few goes at what, what would become that final, that final film uh, creating, you create like um, a situation. So I would fly the bird and then I, you create the camera moves. So then you can go into a separate mode and, and say, oh, I want a camera from above, from the side from behind and then kind of this one's going to swoop around and then once that film was put together then I started going going ahead and kind of backwards engineering it and making the the beginning the tutorial section um, and then kind of doing the voiceover for the whole thing and making the music and stuff so um, yeah it was all kind of you know tools that I had to hand I, I've got a, a decent microphone um, it's, they're quite cheap actually, but it's a nice little setup. And then there's a, um, um, I've got a um, micro Korg as well for, for the music. So I was, I was making that in Logic. So um, yeah, it was, it was all done in, yeah, pretty much where I'm uh, um, talking from right now. <laughs> Um, yeah. How to yeah how to live was um, it was learning a new technique in in, in After Effects so um, I knew I knew how to do it I kind of knew I knew about depth maps and how to kind of create this move but um, I hadn't really put it into effect and then I had to make a whole series of them to kind of create the movie and then there's that last section which was filmed by my partner Claire Barrett uh, which was um, the um, caterpillars turning into butterflies, which um, my, my son had a school project about um, the kind of the transformation of animals and they, they had to look at life cycles. And we've got one of these butterfly net things. You kind of get a butterfly in the post. Well, you get a little um, caterpillar in a, in a pot in, in, in the post and they, they gradually turn into chrysalis. And then, so we filmed that process and, and kind of incorporated that as that idea of kind of yeah, coming out and making a, a new space. Yeah, of life and new life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, again, exactly. I've been to talk about this for a while, but I know you still <laughs> have some questions. I have some questions and we want to get to audience. Sure. Question. One of the things that we were, I mean, um, we were interested in and are interested in relates to, well, we'll probably come back to these works as well, but there's something interesting. Uh, there's many things interesting where there's, um, we were th thinking through the, the, the two works in relation to your past works as well. And that was something that um, I think we were interested in sort of a, um, perhaps investigate in multiple ways. Um, I guess this, especially when you were talking through those themes that you've been interested in multiple ways of, of this sort of anthropological investigation through your own experiences and your own history and then in collaboration with Larry as well, mm. including works like Finding Fanon mm. and FF Gaiden series as well, mm. um, that seem to do a lot with a lot of really collective political histories in multiple ways, questions of race, uh, ethnicities, questions of racism and multiple other things as well. There's something interesting in all of this, right? Even if the kind of style of the works are different in terms of how you work with this question of inversion, right? 
in terms mm. of these seemingly imaginary spaces, but actually completely embedded in real world political issues, mm. which also then implies the question of how does this kind of a, is the real world also sort of a um, game world in certain ways, especially when it comes down to understanding its multiple logics and how it's mm. being constructed. Mm. Do you want to talk a bit more about the ways in which you sort of a relate these works to, again, for instance, the work, your collective work, but also the sort of a like seemingly narratively very different themes as well. Where do you, where do you sort of a like self-narrativize these works in relation to, um, for instance, the collaborations with Larry? Yeah, I guess um, I was thinking about collective experience. I was thinking about it not being, and quite often, in my work, I'm, I'm not centering the viewer so much because <laughs> mm -hmm. it, it's, it's kind of allowing, almost kind of bearing witness to something, even in the works with Larry, with Larry, you know, you see the two avatars, whether they're filmed or whether they're, um, they're um, computer avatars, they're, they're, they're kind of, they're out there. You don't enter into their eye. You don't kind of enter into their space. You hear a story of them. But with these works, I think, um, it's very much, it's becoming kind of, yeah, letting the viewer be the, the agent in a way. And then it's how they take on the messages that are inside it. Uh, do you take it on face value? Do you take it, do you think about the whole thing as construct? Does the fact that it's all the construct negate the, um, the kind of the reality of the affect in a way there's you know there's a kind of it's 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 kind of seductive um the the voice and the music and the the image and it it kind of draws you into a space and do you do you revel in that uh, do you let that take over or do you do you kind of see it from it from a distance and i think it, it's very hard i think it's quite hard to resist in some ways and then i i guess it's kind of talking about manipulation in some ways but at the same time it's it's saying that yes the you know these systems are like a game it's like um it's like in super mario 64 where you you go to the you, you manage to find the edge where the game ends like there's this invisible wall that you can't get past and it's quite hard to find those spots in that game but they they exist and you're kind of you're pressing up against it like a mime artist and you, you realize that, yeah, that if there's the collective will, things can change. You, you know, you see it right now with, with Black Lives Matter. You see it, that it, it takes kind of this switch. It's, it's a bit like the furlough scheme. You know, six months ago, could someone have believed that they would just hand out money to people? Is this possible? No, of course it's not possible. It's like the idea of lockdown. That was impossible. And then suddenly, it, became essential but so the whole of society changes and you think well if that's possible then maybe more things are possible exactly yeah yeah that's that's the ways in which um, our real worlds are anyway upheld by certain imaginaries that also yeah. need to be broken yeah Megan, yeah i'm sorry yeah, yeah go on, go on uh, no no i maybe just one more question um one or two before we pass on we've to the time. audience we've got still time and just to remind um, the audience to think of questions and enter them in the chat and the q a um, so that's one of the things I really loved about both of these videos is that you can read them in a number of different ways. In some ways they're quite ironic because you're clearly poking fun at this how-to um, genre, but they're also really earnest um, at the same time. And I'd be interested to hear you talk a little more about that. So I mean, for instance, there's this beautiful sentence in the how to fly video where you have you know you have this phrase we are not our environment we are not even our bodies as this kind of avatar bird soars through a digital environment and on the one hand of course this is true it's a digital environment it's a digital artwork but at the same time you know as an artist and in your previous work you also show this awareness of how our bodies, our physical realities, our access to technology are absolutely a factor. You know, we absolutely are our bodies. We are our environments. And I think both of those things come through really clearly in both of these videos. Um, I was just wondering if maybe you wanted to, to say anything about 
about that? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a, it's a funny line. It's really, I mean, that was quite a lot of that text from that film is appropriated from a, um, a website that deals with the spiritual significance of animals, um, mostly talking about a heron, but um, I switched it up <laughs> to a cormorant because uh, a, a heron didn't exist in Grand Theft Auto. But, um, <laughs> they, but it's, it's kind of, in some ways, with how to fly, it's almost like the wish that we could transcend our bodies, that we could somehow become this thing that, that the, the kind of the legacy of our, um, of our mortality, of our, of our flesh, is somehow escapable, which it is not. It, it always travels through into the virtual space, whether we like it or not, through our attitudes, through people's reactions to you, that people are making assumptions about um, sex, sexuality, race, all, all of these things when you're interacting online and, and they, they react accordingly. And you, you kind of, you know, is, is there some way to kind of escape that? maybe like but it's i think i always approach these things with utter sincerity <laughs> because it's the only way to give them really a a grounding a a a, a heart because if if you kind of just go in with kind of a emotional detachment as though you don't care about this thing and it's a hey, everything's artifice and like you know i can just put on a different mask and i'm a different person you know, that's it. Just it just becomes facile. It becomes comes it becomes untrue, basically. So you know, there's it's. I want to acknowledge the truth of of affect in a way that that feelings are important and they mean something. And people people act on them a lot of the time. You know, a lot of political acts are are, are often acts created by affect. They're not necessarily created by by thinking. So you you have to kind of combine these different things and, and to. Um, and to use that space to, I guess, yeah, try and try and change people's minds about things or change themselves. I mean, it's a very, they're very intimate works and really I'm just hoping to change, uh, change minds on an individual level. I mean, that's, that's all artworks can do anyway. You know, we're not, it's not the, uh, a kind of a mass media thing. I'm not looking at hundreds of thousands of subscribers on my YouTube channel. I'm, I'm thinking about, just you know, just those few viewers that might see this and really engage with it, and then, um, yeah, either affirm something that they've thought, or kind of maybe make them see something from a slightly different space. Yeah. Affect question is super interesting because of of of, of the ways in which um, I think it doesn't stay personal, but becomes collective. And there's something to be said about transmission of affect as this sort of a political force. We have some questions. So what if we take at least one, I'll sure. read it aloud. And this might be something that actually plays nicely also, obviously you could you, David, but also Megan's um, interest and, and expertise. I'll read it aloud. Is, um, thank you to Alessandro Vincentelli for the question. It is said that lockdown quarantine has been remarkably creative and perhaps represented by an age of amateurism. <laughs> and this is meant as a good, in a good way. Um, yes. New ways of TV, DIY and working it out, importantly of solidarity with others that was already sort of we touched upon this. So the how-to videos David makes play towards this new time really well. Would panel agree? And I think what we could pick up from this perhaps exactly would be those questions of amateurism, perhaps questions of hackerism and amateurism. And then something that I know that also Megan is really good in talking about is, is, is fandom and the ways in which that sort of a plays into this sort of questions of perhaps you know, collective production, but also solidarity and multiple other things. So I wonder if, if, if you two can pick up on some of these themes. Megan, do you want to go first? Sure, why not? Um, I guess I would just begin with a cautionary statement of, you know, when we talk about amateurism, what is involved in those assumptions, right? So often we talk about people who are able to make certain kinds of content, you know, to make fan videos, to make fan artwork. Um, which is great, obviously, and is happening a lot, but there are also 
some assumptions there in terms of who has who has time and access to learn those kinds of skills. Um, you know, who whose work is considered amateur versus professional, right? So David, I don't think I would consider you, um, you know, an, an amateur video maker um, in this instance. So well, yeah. <laughs> rather than an answer, I guess, maybe, you know, an additional question of what do we mean when we talk about amateurs and, you know, whose work does that involve praising? Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm interested in, in the space of fandom and, um, fan-made things, fan cultures. Um, I was obsessed with the fighting game community for many years. Um, made it kind of started making a documentary about the UK fighting scene. Um, and, um, which is all, yeah, it's all to do with, yeah, fighting video games, <laughs> not, not like kind of wrestling or something, but, um, it's, and the things that you see there, the communities that you see built, um, are so it's kind of such an exciting space you kind of feel like there's sort of a, a a real communality that happens through a shared love of of a thing i mean it, it has it has its problems too but this is this is something else um but i guess in in my practice i'm often imposing on myself a sort of amateurism because i'm always I, I i like to push myself into trying something new with most with most work like I'll do something that I haven't quite done before in order to make it and it becomes you know I'm it's like many artists will you know say a, a painter they'll be perfecting their technique they'll be perfecting their style they'll create the the painting and then they create more and more that kind of develops their their particular skill in that thing my particular skill is maybe editing but mostly it's just finding the tool and they're often tools that exist in the world that is right for what I want to do and then learning that and that, that kind of learning process becoming part of the work and part of the practice so it's constantly kind of investigating new spaces and um, investigating this, the communities that live around those spaces so that's that's how I came across tutorial videos was sort of through this kind of trying to learn things and then kind of entering into that world you know like creating my own fighting game it's like kind of you you enter into this space to, in order to engage with it fully in some way and try and understand what that spy, space might mean for not just me but for all the people who, who take part in that space um yeah. yeah i don't know if that answers the question <laughs> no i guess we often kind of we oppose the amateur with the corporate mm. you know and mm. i think you really usefully occupy this kind of middle ground where you're using popular culture and using some of these corporate forms to kind of mm. adjust them revise them make people think differently about them potentially yeah i think i think my practice has been kind of built on on this in a way problematic space that that there are these objects that be made as through mass culture through corporate endeavor like records and games and uh big movies that i love so and i know that it's ridiculous that i should love this thing that has been created you know as a capitalist endeavor but i do like it's, it's you know i i love splatoon and i <laughs> i i love the films of miyazaki as, as I mentioned in one of the other questions like you know the, these are things that that, that need um a kind of a mass culture to create because they kind of involve enormous amounts of money but they also you know the fan culture around them is as fascinating and as interesting as the artifacts themselves you know people are drawn to these things people identify with them and often find themselves through them you know it may not that fascination may not remain the same for their whole lives but you know Kurt Cobain's death still affects me. It's like it's what is one of those is is kind of one of those transition moments in life. So, yeah, it's it's um, I even back back from my my early lip sync films where I was lip syncing to different soul songs and hip hop and things. And it's like you know the the absurdity of my position is kind of made made clear. But there's also it's it's evident that I kind of that. That I love it and I believe in it, and this is this. You know, I'm kind of owning that 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 
love in a way and that that that, that is a part of me despite the problems of that situation um you already mentioned that you, <laughs> you love Miyazaki films, so we can <laughs> move on to um, James's question, perhaps. Uh, you mentioned you start with a script and improvise. Does this include improvising with movement, the game as well? We noticed, we all noticed what happened to the bird. <laughs> so, um, uh, <laughs> this is something Yeah, it was, um, well, that, yeah, it, I mean, I guess it is, um, yeah, it's kind of, it's it's similar to the script in that I'll have an idea of a, of a vague thing that I want to do um, to fly. I, I knew that there was this cool valley in in uh, Grand Theft Auto. I've kind of seen it before. I don't think we've actually used it in any of the Gaiden, Finding Fanon films or FF Gaiden, but I, I knew of it, you know, as... Um, and I thought it would be the kind of the perfect sort of V-shaped thing to go through as a, as a flying object. Um, but, um, you know, apart from that, I didn't, I didn't kind of calculate how many flaps I was going to do. I, yeah, I, I, I did that takeoff quite a few times because I, I kept not leaving enough time at the beginning in order to kind of do the setup shot. So I'd have to do it again. And then, yeah, one of the times I crashed into the into the, the the bridge, and it just seemed like a kind of perfect, it kind of a perfect foil to my stuttering delivery at that moment. It's like kind of breaking down this idea that it's all constructed, and but then of course you know that I've chosen to keep that one in, so it's like you know what what was that was that mean? It's kind of you know it adds to the artifice in some ways. Yeah, absolutely. Uh... There's a, there's a question from Petra. Um, do you have any plans of experimenting with and or developing more work in game engines, such as Unity, Unreal, making game-esque environments or games for viewers to occupy and interact with, or video work that responds a bit differently to time? This is a super interesting question, right? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I would, I guess, I guess I want to. <laughs> it's, yeah, there's, um, and I have big plans for the world after, so, I, I'd really love to kind of expand on that world to, and although it was made as a reaction against the digital in many ways to try and to come off the screen, it lends itself quite naturally to turning back into a video game to being this kind of this other space. I mean, you know, maybe a multi online player game or something, but um, I mean, that would be awesome. <laughs> but um, yeah, Unity is something that I'm I can, I'm kind of proficient with, but kind of rubbish with as well. I can use it to do the thing that I need to do, but yeah, I need some more some more time with it to really really master it. And then, but yeah, I I would love to. Um, yeah, thanks, Petra. <laughs> I think uh, you're probably better with it than me. Let's see uh, what we're doing with questions. Um, I think we've got time for us to continue. Megan, do you want to pick up on any kind of things that we had? Oh, I didn't mention what was my favorite Miyazaki. Oh, yeah, exactly. You didn't. So <laughs> we sort of left yeah. hanging there. Um, oh, God. Um, I mean, that's a big question. I think, <laughs> in some ways, I think My Neighbor Totoro, because it's just so, and I know it's such an early film, but it has that element of childhood. It's just, watchable hundreds of times and you know although spirited away in some ways is is more elegant i think my neighbor totoro just just it's just joyful you know so it oh. down said good <laughs> got influenced voices oh this is in the chat are you influenced at no, all was... by nature writing oh, i missed that somehow no, it's in the chat rather than the Q and A. Um, oh. How to fly reminded me of uh, of Peregrine. Oh yeah. Um, well, I mean, I read. I guess I read nature writing. Um, I read more science fiction really at the moment, um, like Octavia Butler and um, Ursula Le Guin and people like that. But um, I've just finished um, the. Uh, a door to ocean 
which oh, what's the name of the author again but that's really that's really interesting i'd definitely recommend that but nature nature writing i guess i've kind of had an an affinity with poetry for a very long time <laughs> um both through hip-hop but also just through um poetry free verse and stuff so um that's that's kind of more where i've come from and landscape has been part of my life forever since kind of going out with my dad to draw landscapes from an early age so um yeah i think that maybe that ties into that clifford um yeah thanks <laughs> thanks emily well, probably many of the science fiction writers you mentioned are excellent in terms of writing nature in you in terms of multiple histories yeah, yeah and um yeah ex talking about how environments affect societies in many ways so um yeah just think of the left hand of darkness or something but, yeah. yeah well speaking yeah. of climate sci-fi have you read nk jemison's um trilogy of, of books yeah if not definitely Highly recommended. That's next next on my list. I've been reading yeah. um, the Black Future Month, but yeah, I need to need to read that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we got into um, a stage where we're sharing uh, literature. Text. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, maybe end on some kind of hopeful question or. Uh, <laughs> well, I. I I mean, yeah, do we do? Does the audience have? I, I mean, I can. I have a question that has to. It sounds really grandiose, but it can be actually quite straightforward as well. There's something about again. Perhaps you re responded to this already, but the, okay, the ways in which you really constantly play with history in so many ways, but the sort of a, like the rhetoric of the present and the now that strikes through these works is really forceful. There is something, though, that seems to be coming through the lines and perhaps with the hints that the, the, the moment, the, the present moment, the now moment in these narratives of these two works is not merely for the sort of a solace of the individual, but there's something of a activist moment there. Am I reading too much into it? Or what do you think in terms of what sense we're dealing with? Um... I guess I have a, I, I very much had an activist intention. <laughs> yeah. I don't know whether it quite, you know, if you've picked up on that, that's fantastic. But yeah. um, I've tried, I think, you know, especially since working with Larry, I think I've, I've tried to make my works more direct because I have a propensity to kind of try and abstract to, towards abstraction and towards sort of, poetic metaphor and sometimes it's necessary to just go actually this is what I mean <laughs> and um, I think yeah working with with Larry has really really helped me to do that um, but so so yes it, I, you know I want them to be in some ways how to live is like a it's like a requiem it's sort of like looking at these dead images that are coming back to life but it's also um yeah i, I also want it to be like a manifesto that that things you know the present moment is something that can change and if this changes then the future can change mm, right. megan do you have any sort of a final questions and thoughts that you would like to share? Because, you know. I think honestly, that's a perfect moment to, to end on. Um, I would like to believe that there's hope that things can change and that, you know, through fantasy and despite, you know, the corporatization of popular culture and all this kind of stuff, that there is still hope that we can change, change the world through what we love. Excellent. Great. Thank and you. I don't think we have any more questions, urgent ones from the audience. So one more time, a massive thank you, David, both for the discussion and the works. Everybody should go and see them if you haven't. And if you have, see them again. <laughs> and thank you, Megan. This was amazing. This was a really great conversation. I And, and thank you, John Hansard Gallery, for having us do this discussion and for organizing and helping and and setting up the work online and everything and thank you audience thank you so very much. much for sharing and thank you david for your fantastic work all right thank, thank you mech and yes it was, it, was, it was excellent to talk to you okay very well, we enjoyable again. thanks everyone for coming <laughs> thank you and yeah. bye 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 bye